Good morning everybody. Today's video is going to be jam-packed with a whole bunch of different uh, activities. Last night I went to uh, an elderberry patch that I had marked last season and took some cuttings so that I can root them in our yard. If you remember from a previous video, last fall I created an elderberry bed for this season's transplants. Elderberry is native to North America and has long been used for its medicinal properties. Both the berries and the flowers on the plant are packed with antioxidants and vitamins that can boost your immune system. They can also help tame inflammation, uh, ease cold and flu symptoms. You want to take your softwood elderberry cuttings in early spring when they're just breaking dormancy. So for instance, this is one of the cuttings I took last night. It has little green uh, leaves starting to form. So it's just breaking dormancy. You wanna take four to six inch uh, length cuts and cut them at a 45 degree angle on the bottom just below a bud intersection there. From those buds is where the roots will form. Obviously this cutting is a little bit more than four to six inches. Four to six inches is the minimum that you wanna, you wanna cut off the plant to to transplant. Elderberries are um, self-pollinating, so you technically don't need more than one variety to uh, grow a crop, but to get larger berries and a more fruitful harvest, it's best to have a couple different varieties of cultivators to help cross-pollinate. Again, not necessary. The patch of elderberries that I located last year had, it was maybe 75 yards to 100 yards long, bunch of elderberry, huge patch. So I went to a few different bushes to collect my cuttings. For all I know, they could all be the same variety, the same cultivator, but uh, we're gonna give it a shot. I'm just gonna transplant all of these out into the garden. Originally, I was only planning on doing uh, three transplants at six to 10 feet apart as recommended, but when you look at mother nature, she doesn't practice spacing like that. It's just where it can take root and grows, it grows. And like the patch that I harvested these from, it was dense, dense elderberry all the way through. So, I don't know, I've got maybe 10, 10 plus um, cuttings here. I'm just gonna fill this whole bed up with cuttings and what takes root takes root, what doesn't doesn't, and someday if I need to thin it out, I can certainly do that. So, to select what branches to cut your cuttings from, you wanna choose a branch that is one year old. So basically this was the end of a, of a branch that was established and this grew last season. So this is, it's going into its second season now. The bud union at the bottom, as I mentioned, you wanna cut your 45 degree at the bottom of the bud union, pinch off those leaves, but leave, you want at least one set of leaves at the top of your cutting. Those leaves are gonna open up and start collecting sunlight to photosynthesize and give the plants energy to grow. If you don't have any leaves on the top of this, it's it's not, it might grow, but it's not gonna do very well. So leave at least one, maybe two bud unions and pinch off the bottom ones and roots are gonna form out of the bottom. There's multiple different ways of doing this from what I've researched. Um, you could literally just take these, cut them off the plants and just stick them right in the ground and they might take. Just to hopefully ensure some success here, I'm going to be using a rooting hormone to make sure that these things uh, can take root in their new location and hopefully will be successful. I thought this was pretty cool so I took some notes and I wanted to mention it. You can actually use raw honey as a rooting hormone. It contains enzymes that promote root growth. It's a natural antiseptic and contains antifungal properties all of which are reasons why raw honey is believed to work so well as a rooting hormone. I do have some raw honey left over from last season's harvest, but selfishly, I want it. I don't wanna, I don't wanna use it. Especially since I already have this on hand, uh, I'm just gonna use this and, and we'll see how it does. Sometime in the future, I'll definitely use some raw honey and see if I can get some things to root. So I took uh, my cuttings last night, I put them in a jar filled with water. So these have been in the water maybe, uh, let's see, 12 hours now. What I'm gonna do is open this jar, this uh, rooting hormone, take my cutting out and stick it down in the hormone, maybe a couple inches, I guess as deep as this goes, I'll stick it down in there all the way. And then we'll take them out into the garden here and I'm gonna move my mulch away to get down to the soil. I got a stick so I can stick the stick down in the soil, drop my cutting down into the soil with the rooting hormone on it and that'll prevent the rooting hormone from getting uh, rubbed off if I was just to shove it right down into the soil, kind of pre, pre making a hole will help keep that rooting hormone uh, on the cutting. Although my, my bed is pretty well prepared, I'm still gonna take some compost and put it around the base of the hormone, or uh, the base of the uh, cutting, and then I will uh, backfill with my mulch and uh, we'll let them go. I think it takes, I know if I was to uh, 
just leave them in here for six to eight weeks. They'll form roots, but the roots are not as strong as if you were to, to do it right away in soil. So I think it actually goes a little bit quicker in soil too. So who knows, maybe four, five, six weeks from now, it, it should be forming roots and they're pretty hardy and aggressive. So it should form uh, quite a bit of growth uh, just this year. Shoot, we might even get a crop already this year. I'm not 100% sure about that, but that's uh, the joys of gardening. We'll, we'll learn a little something here. Okay, I just went through the garden and removed the mulch and stuck that stick in the ground to kind of create a hole there. So let's start uh, dunking these in the rooting hormone. As I mentioned, these have been soaking in water for 12 hours now. Just gonna stick them down in this powder as far as they'll go. Tap off any excess powder here. And there you have it. So this is ready to be stuck down in the ground. Let's go do that quick. All right, so this is a hole that I created. I'm just gonna take our cutting and set it right down inside. That little hole there a couple inches is good enough. And then uh, I gotta set the camera down to do this, but I'm gonna pinch that soil up against it to hold it in place. And then I'm gonna take some, uh, actually I don't even need compost, honestly. What I did is I put down eight inches of chipped tree remains from a local tree service. I did that last year, and then I put a good couple inches of leaf litter on top of that. So I'm actually just gonna take this leaf litter and kinda put it around the base here. And I'm gonna leave this hole open. I'm not gonna backfill it with mulch and, and bury, I'd be burying our leaves then basically. So I'm just gonna let this thing take root. As it grows up, this mulch is gonna continue to break down and settle. And uh, as, I, as it grows up, I can backfill it with mulch a little bit too. Man, when I remove this mulch, tons of earthworms down there. The soil is so light and loamy. I just, eat. <laughs> I'm gonna say it again. Mother Nature is modest, she loves to be covered. Always mulch your garden beds. There's so many benefits to it. Okay, that cutting is in the ground. As you can see, I've got uh, landmines all over here that I'm gonna stick uh, elderberry, elderberry cuttings down in. I'm just gonna leave, leave this mulch here that I pulled out. It's a good identifier for where I've planted. I can come back later in the season and backfill up against the plants. All right, each of our elderberry cuttings has found itself a new home. Even though when I pulled the mulch back, it was very moist in there. Everything's dry out here, but the mulch retains that moisture, which is another great benefit of mulch. I'm still gonna go through and water everything just to give it a good head start. And then we'll be wrapping this project up and it's up to mother nature from there. So this is the biggest project we've got going on right now. I marked out this area in the yard, took my neighbor's tiller. Shelly from uh, Whiskey and Sunshine Off Grid. This is why I had to put you in my pocket during that live chat so I could continue working. Sorry I missed some of the live chat because of that. But as I was saying, I tilled all of this out with a tiller and shoveled everything out by hand. So I've got this nice cut into this hillside here. I'm gonna be taking brick just like we did for our fireplace and we've got a bed up there that I designed and built with the same style brick. I'm gonna put a big retaining wall in here. It'll only be a couple of feet tall. These two stakes here, uh, I'm putting some hazelnut trees in, and then everything around here will be just general garden space. I haven't decided what to do in there yet. But the reason I'm doing all of this is because we're putting a swing set right here with a bridge to a tall tower, a spiral slide, some monkey bars in the back. It's going to be massive. It's going to be a huge play set for the kiddos uh, that they can enjoy for years to come. So the remainder of this weekend, I will be... Uh... That'll be my primary focus. Hey, baby. Look who joined me. I think he's awake. Say hi. Whoa. Say hi. Mm -hmm. Can you say hi to the camera? Jump. Okay, jump. <laughs> Whoa. What's, hey, what's daddy building here? In a park? I'm building a park. Swing sets, jungle gyms, play sets, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Emmy refers to them all as parks. Queen. <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of backbreaking work, but uh, it's gonna last us a lot of years, and the kids are really gonna enjoy it. Admittedly, I'm not a very religious person, but uh, as I get older, I find myself trying to be. A verse that really uh, stuck out to me when it comes to all the hard work that I do here on our property is, "It's good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth." Lamentations chapter 3 verse 27. I first heard that verse watching the Back to Eden documentary many many years ago with uh, Paul Gauchy. He cited it. I do a lot of 
a lot of work here on the homestead that could probably be done a lot quicker with with machinery it feels good to get out here and and bust my butt you just appreciate things a lot more but that verse always stuck out to me i'm young now i've got the energy i've got the strength now is the time to break my back to build this homestead up to what i want it to be so i can enjoy the fruit of my labor literally uh, years down the road when I'm older so yeah that's uh, the big project we're gonna be working on this weekend let's head inside quick and check on uh, Sarah and Elliot hey hi how's it going good just feeding Elliot so I wanted to take a minute to uh, share with you guys some health updates I guess well actually let's start with your uh, career change I went from Children's Hospital to the Children's Surgery Center um, just two weeks ago, and I'm loving the change. It's a good fit for our family. I don't work as much. I come home earlier. I don't have to do any call or weekends, holidays. Yeah, so she's definitely so. around with the family much more now. She's actually, this past week, uh, came home and was able to make dinner for the first time in... A long time. A long time, yeah. Well, at a reasonable time. I've made dinners at, well, before, but not yeah. at like 7.30, 8 o'clock at of, night. Yeah. Instead of eating at bedtime, we, we actually ate at a decent time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is a, it's a good change. Another update with this little guy. So probably in the beginning of the year, we um, discovered that he had like a full body rash for a long time. That went on for like two months. Um, and no creams or anything would help. We were told it was just eczema. Until it just wouldn't go away, no matter what we did. So we took him in and we did some blood work and found out that he's allergic to dairy. Um, and I'm not willing to give up breastfeeding yet. So that meant I am now dairy free. So we have to read absolutely every single label. Um, we're limited on what we can eat. I know that there's a lot of options out there now for dairy-free. Um, so Thank it's just, you, vegans. Yeah, it's just <laughs> <laughs> getting used to knowing what I can eat and can't eat and then slowly changing over our household as well. Hopefully he can grow out of it, but only time will tell. Yeah, that was kind of a bummer to find out, but uh... It is what it is, and like Sarah said, hopefully he grows out of it. Being in the in the dairy state, it's kind of a bummer to be <laughs> have a, da a dairy allergy. And the vegan cheese is not the same. <laughs> yeah, vegan cheese so far is not very good. It's a good thing he's cute, hey? <laughs> Anything for our little guy. And our little girl's out playing. Yeah, I left her outside. She made an appearance in the video already. I'll be I'll, I'll go back out there shortly. So that's uh that's Elliot's health update and how it's affected. Oh, uh, Emmy's at the front door. Let's go get Emmy quick. <laughs> you want to come in? No, you just wanted to ring the doorbell. Come here, mommy's inside. All right, we got the whole family here on the couch now. So the last big health update. When I was pregnant with Elliot, I started having some symptoms. Told my doctors that they should do some blood work. Um, come to find out that my thyroid levels were off and so we were monitoring them for a while. And they put me on medication for it. Um, and since I had him, I was wondering why I was still on the medication. So we did some testing to find out if I could go off my medication. Um, and turns out I have Hashimoto's disease. So that's a new diagnosis for me. Um, just a few days ago is when I was told. So we need to figure out what that all means and deal with it. Yeah, it's gonna be a lifelong thing that she'll have to deal with now, whether that means... Possible hormone like treatment if needed. Right now I don't need it. Yeah. But I guess having thyroid issues or having Hashimoto's disease makes you more prone to miscarriages. So I wonder if that's why I lost our second pregnancy, but I was able to have this one. Who knows, but uh, for whatever reason, second pregnancy wasn't meant to be, but we've got a rainbow boy, rainbow, rainbow boy now. <laughs> A smiley, happy little boy. So those are some of the uh, health updates with our family and career updates. I'm down in the basement. I wanted to give you guys a quick update on our uh, seed starts. These are roughly a week old now. 
It looks like our King of the North peppers have not sprouted yet, the ghost peppers have not sprouted, and the stevia has not sprouted either, but the early jalapenos have definitely sprouted and are looking very healthy. Looks like we've got a pretty good germination rate going for these guys. So pretty excited about that. Back outside. Told you we're gonna be covering a lot in this video. This is a bat house. I've wanted to have a bat house on the property for quite a while now. Uh, and my mother-in-law was nice enough to purchase me one uh, last year. The best time to put up a bat house is in the springtime, which it is now, so that's what we're gonna do. You might be wondering why on earth I'd want to install a bat house on my property. Took some notes again, love to take notes. Installing a bat house on your property can provide a safe environment for bats while protecting your yard from insects such as mosquitoes, moths, and beetles. Bat houses give females a safe, warm place to raise their young. Since most female bats only have one pup each year, bat populations grow very slowly. Additionally, due to habitat loss and degradation, it is becoming harder for bats to locate natural roost sites to raise their young. By installing a bat house, you provide mothers and their pups a safe home and ensure that the population continues to grow. On the back of the bat house here, there's some uh, additional information. There are over 47 species of bats found in the United States and Canada. Bats can consume half of their weight in insects each night when mosquitoes are most active. A single little brown bat can consume up to 1,000 mosquitoes in a single hour. Many bat species are endangered from habitat loss and disease. Bats prefer to roost within a quarter mile of water. Neighborhoods with mature trees are also ideal for bat houses. I don't think we have a permanent water source within a quarter mile of our house, but I do see bats here flying around at night during the summer months, so they must be finding water somewhere. So there's just a, a few of the facts, factoids on the back of this bat house. Wow. So this is a three chamber bat house. There's single chamber, two chambers, three chambers. I'm sure there's more than three chambers as well. This bat house alone, look at how small it is, can hold up to 75 bats. So I'm gonna tape off the inside of the bat house here because in our region you wanna paint the outside of your bat house is black so they can absorb as much sunlight as possible because we are in a colder region of the country and you wanna keep the inside of your bat houses warm enough especially during the winter months, that the bats will be comfortable inside there. I mentioned that uh, spring is a good time to set your bat houses up. That's because bats hibernate in the winter and they will be coming out of hibernation shortly. So having your house set up and ready to go by the time that they, they come out of hibernation is a good, better your chances of, of getting some inhabitants in it. So just because I'm putting a bat house up doesn't mean it's gonna be inhabited by bats anytime soon. It could take a couple of years um, before something finds the house and takes up residence in it. One thing I'm gonna try to try and increase my chances of bats locating this house is Uncle Dunkle's, Uncle Dunkle's bat nip, bat house attractant. It's a spray that you can spray on the entryway to the uh, bat house and supposedly is supposed to attract bats to it. Who knows if it works or not. I'll, uh, if you're interested in it, I'll drop a link in the description below. One of the benefits to having bats on your property is uh, their, their poop, their guano, is a great garden fertilizer. I haven't quite figured out how I would go about collecting it. I don't even know if I'd, I'd have enough to collect to make it worthwhile, but that's uh, an interesting fact about bat poop. All right, so I've got this taped off. That There are some slots in the sides and in the front to allow airflow for the summer months. The center chamber, which I have taped off, is completely confined. That's where the bats would stay in the winter. Uh, but when it's hot in the summer, airflow is good for them. So I'm just gonna, it's gonna be hard to tape this off. So I'm, I'm just gonna spray paint and kind of try to avoid spraying too much paint inside of the uh, bat house. I just got off the phone with my dad, telling him what I'm working on right now. I plan on putting this bat house over by the beehives, and he brought up a question, are the bats and the bees gonna interfere with each other? Are there, is there gonna be any conflict from it? And that's something that I uh, thought about already and researched. And the bees and the bats work opposing shifts. Obviously, bats are nocturnal, so that the bats will be out and about at night when the bees are already in their hive, uh, for the night. Then during the day, the bees come out of the 
out of the hive and the bats are already up in the bat house asleep for the day. So they work opposing shifts. They, they really shouldn't have any uh, any issues being right being near each other back in the woods there. All right, while the bat house is drying, I'm moving on to my next project. I've got a lot of little projects I want to wrap up before I get going on that uh, swing set. I ordered some uh, seed potatoes to plant out in the garden. I've got three bags this size, two of which are Yukon Golds. For the first time, I'm going to try uh, French fingerling potatoes. So these are more of a, a oblong, a smaller potato that's kind of a... It's almost a, a, it's a, it's a decorative type potato almost, something, uh, ah, they're fingerling potatoes, look them up. But I've got a whole bunch of Yukon Gold potatoes from the garden last year that I kind of forgot about in the basement, and they all sprouted, like, sprouted a lot. So rather than toss all of these sprouted potatoes out, I'm gonna utilize them and see if I can't grow a crop off of them. All right, we're out at the orchard in the backyard. This portion of the orchard is kind of unused right now. I'm gonna utilize the Ruth Stout method to plant these potatoes and see how they do. So the Ruth Stout method, basically, you set your potatoes on top of the soil. You don't dig them into the soil. You just set them on top of the soil, cover them with straw. They'll take root into the soil and they'll produce new spuds within that mulched uh, straw layer. And it actually keeps your potatoes cleaner than digging them up in the soil. So this is this is new for me. I'm, I'm kind of excited to see if it works or not. Uh, so let's get going on that. Okay, I formed one trench here and I kind of piled up the mulch that I pulled out on either side to basically make the trench deeper. This is down to the soil now. So I'm going to take my potatoes and start lining this trench with the potatoes. Then I'm going to go grab some straw and uh, pile it up with straw. I'll probably have to make a couple more rows or at least another row because I have quite a few potatoes that I'm going to plant out in here. I've got my potatoes. I'm going to try and get these out of here without breaking too many of the sprouts okay so these potatoes are all different sizes you can see the potato has a good sprout coming out of it these sprouts are taking all their nutrients and all their energy to grow from the tuber itself so what I want to do I'm gonna try and set these so the sprouts are pointing up uh, some of these might be pretty long well here you go here's a really long sprout I don't want that much of the sprout hanging up and out of the ground so what I'm gonna do is kind of lay it in the ground and then twist it up at the very end so the tip is sticking up. Theoretically, all of these node sites on this sprout should produce new potatoes. Now one of the things about the Ruth Stout method, uh, when Ruth started developing this, she didn't necessarily follow the guidelines of planting every foot or two feet or whatever for spacing. As I kind of touched on with the elderberries, Mother Nature doesn't practice spacing either. Now there's benefits to practicing spacing in a uh, cultivated garden, that being that you're giving your, your plants enough room to fully develop and produce the best possible fruit that they can produce because they're getting all the nutrients, they're not overcrowded and competing with each other for those nutrients. With the Ruth Stout method, she kind of just tossed her potatoes in the trench, or tossed them on the ground I should say, dumped, basically dumped a bag and then just covered it all with, with straw and had great success doing so. So I'm going to kind of practice that too with this particular um, batch of, of potatoes here. I'm just going to kind of toss them in here right next to each other. Let nature do its thing. Let's see how these do. You might ask yourself why, why these sprouts need to poke up out of the surface. Because when you plant a typical seed potato that just has a little sprout coming out of it, they're not breaking through the surface yet. But because these have grown so much, they've used up quite a bit of energy in that seed potato already. I want to make sure they're right at the surface so they can start leafing out and getting energy from the sun instead of using the reserves within the potato. Uh, if I were to bury all these, they might have enough juice left in them to, to get up through the surface and take off, but I really want to make sure that I'm setting these up for success by putting the ends of each sprout up at sunlight level so they can start leafing out. Hi, baby. Look at my cool daughter. She's got so much style. But yeah, so by putting them, putting the ends of the shoots up, up toward the su uh, sunlight, it just gives them that little bit of a head start, a little bit of a boost in taking root in their new location. Can you put this one in the trench? Can you put it down in the trench? Yeah. All right, we've got a whole slew of potatoes in our trench here. 
I'm gonna go grab some straw and start filling this trench in with straw. It's best to use straw in your gardens as opposed to hay because hay tends to harbor a lot of seeds. So I'm just gonna keep my sprouts just at the surface there. Get this guy covered a little bit more. All right, I've got the straw covering our first trench there. I've got a whole other bag of uh, seed potatoes there, so I'm gonna make another trench on this side and fill that in using the same method. So much like our maple syrup incident, kind of a bummer that I let all these potatoes sprout like this, but turn your negatives into positives and I'm doing a little experiment with them now and see if this works out. If it does work, it's a lot easier than digging your potatoes into the ground. So this might be a new way of uh, growing potatoes for me in the future. Okay, both trenches are done. I've got a bale left, which I'm just going to leave here. As this settles over the next coming weeks, I can add more straw. And as the plants grow, I can continue to bury them and mound them up, which will just give us a better opportunity to, to, to grow more potatoes. The straw sat over the winter in our orchard, so it's, it's really wet inside of it. Um, so I'm not going to come through and water this. We do have rain in the forecast for next week So I'm gonna let mother nature take care of the rest of this for me All right I'm down at our formal garden beds now where I'm gonna be planting the seed potatoes that I ordered first thing I'm gonna do is remove the mulch in trenches to allow access to the soil so I can bury the potatoes I'm gonna bury them about an inch deep in the soil the top of the potato will be an inch covered by an inch of soil, I should say. As I mentioned, I'm going to be doing the French fingerling potatoes as well as the Yukon gold potatoes in this bed. And something I've done every year with my potatoes is I will put a handful of worm castings around each tuber before I bury it. So I can show the link uh, to the worm castings that I currently purchase. That is something I'd like to do someday to be able to produce my own worm castings. All right, I ordered four pounds of Yukon Gold Potato Starts. So I'm gonna space these out in these two trenches evenly in the space I have available here. Um, there's a, a few different ways that you can start seed potatoes. The way I choose to do, and I've always done it this way, is just to take your whole seed potato and just drop it in the soil, cover it up by an inch or two, put the mulch back over it, call it a day. You can do your research and pick the, the way that is easiest for you or best suits your gardening style. I'm kind of a lazy gardener. I prefer to let mother nature do the work. So I just take my whole seed potato, dig a hole, drop it in there and call it a day. Okay, I've got my potatoes evenly spaced. Now I'm gonna go through and dig a little hole at each location. Man, this soil looks great. Four years of organic matter being added to it. Try and keep my mulch from getting mixed in down there. We don't want wood chips underneath the soil level. That's pretty good. Drop my potato in. This is the worm castings that I choose to use. Again, uh, link will be in the description below. And then I just take a handful of my worm castings, spread it out around the seed potato, backfill it with some soil, kind of lightly compress, and then uh, just move the mulch back over it. Simple as that. So I'm gonna do that with the rest of these. And then we're gonna come back and move the mulch away in the center trench, and that's where I'm gonna put the fingerling potatoes. All of the Yukons are in the ground now. I'm gonna go back and put the fingerlings in. Okay, fingerlings are in. That's a wrap on our potatoes. I'm just gonna come through and give these a good watering. Again, we've got rain in the forecast, so it doesn't have to be too thorough, but that'll give them a good jump start. Check out these garlic sprouts. Garlic is looking phenomenal. As I mentioned in one of my previous videos, I've had a really challenging time growing garlic in the past. I don't know why, it's supposed to be a pretty easy thing to grow. It's looking really good this year. This is the music variety of garlic. Very happy with how it's turning out. Back inside doing a quick data dump, rehydrating, and then I'll be heading back outside. This footage really uh, adds up quickly. A lot of editing goes into this stuff. So as I was uploading our data to the computer, I jumped on YouTube Studio and looked at some of our analytics, and it looks like 90.8% of our viewers are not subscribed to our channel. Come on, you guys, help us out. Subscribing is quick and easy, doesn't cost you anything, and it helps the YouTube algorithm get our channel out there to the masses. It would help us out a lot. Please hit that subscribe button. So I'm sitting back by the beehives. Um, if you're new to the channel, these are not our personal beehives. These are a friend of ours, Scott Hempkins Hives. He uh, was my bee mentor last season and is gonna continue to keep these hives out on our property. We did purchase two Green Acre hives that we will be putting out here hopefully later this month. Scott just came out here the other day to check up on the hives and as you can see, 
The hive over my right shoulder here is doing phenomenally well. Very, very healthy hive. But unfortunately, the hive directly behind me did not make it. They made it through the winter. They were coming into spring here. Low numbers, but uh, they ended up dying from American fowl brood. I'm still learning quite a bit about bees, um, so I'm gonna read off Wikipedia here what AFB is. It's a spore-forming bacteria. It's a highly infectious bee disease. It's most widespread and destructive of the bee brood diseases. So it's my understanding that this disease is all around us. It can be found in the soil, it's naturally occurring. This disease gets in the hive, gets into the, uh, the brood, and it can wipe out a hive really quickly. Unfortunately, that's what happened to the hive behind me. And uh, Scott came out here yesterday, cleaned out all the, all the frames inside the hive, gave all the dead bees to the chickens. Uh, he left the bottom brood box here because this hive next to me is doing so well, he intends on splitting this hive. It's a bummer, it's, it's a big loss. It's part of beekeeping though, you can do everything right and still fail. You can do everything wrong and still succeed. It's, it's just how it goes sometimes. Glad to see that this hive is doing so well next to me though. Bringing a lot of pollen in right now actually. It's supposed to get up to 70 degrees today, so a lot of activity out here. It's very soothing to sit next to the bees and listen to them humming, watching them come and go. While I'm in the apiary, I did plant, transplant three different varieties of grapes in here, which brings us to six different varieties of grape vines growing on our property right now. I'm also putting up a, a fence enclosure around the apiary, which the grape vines are gonna grow up, and also this will allow me to bring my chickens in here at the end of winter when we have all these dead bee carcasses laying on the ground, the chickens will be able to come in here, clean up all the carcasses, they'll turn them into eggs, just keep our, keep our apiary a little bit cleaner here. So that's another project I'm working on. What are we building? Park. We're building a park. All right, we're starting on the kids' play set. This is the first of 10,000 cuts. I'm not gonna be filming all this and boring you guys with it. Over the next video or two, I'll just give you progress updates. So uh, here, witness the first cut. Voila, the first cut. Board was a little bit too long, slightly over eight feet. Cool. And just like that, all of our wood is cut. The magic of video and editing. Okay, our bad house is dry. Let's go get this bad boy installed. Now technically, they recommend not installing it on trees because of the increased chance of predators getting into it. I've got some tall trees. I'm gonna put it up in a tree and uh, we'll see how it does. I'm not gonna get my hopes up that this will get occupied anytime soon. They say if it isn't occupied within two years, then they recommend uh, trying a new location. Only 15% of bad houses are actually occupied. So I'll be incredibly surprised if we get some occupancy in this house. But it's something I wanted to try, so we'll see how it does. We're in the apiary, and I've selected this tree to put the bat house in. I cleared out some of the branches on the tree to give the bats room to swoop in and out of the bat house. It's recommended that you put your bat house between 12 and 20 feet up, and they need a clear area in front of the tree, as I said, to, to swoop in and out of the bat house, drop in and out. So there's our bat house, probably hard to see right now. So I'm gonna go up there and spray it with that Uncle Dunkel's uh, attractant spray and apparently you have to apply that once a month until it's occupied. I forgot to mention too that you wanna have your bat house facing south so it receives six to eight hours of direct sunlight a day. And the inside of that bat house needs to be between I think 80 and 100 degrees for the mothers to uh, take care of their young in there. As I mentioned, we've got rain in the forecast for the coming week, so I want to get our rain barrels set up to start collecting some water. I already went up on the roof and cleared out the gutters so we don't uh, get any clogs. All right, we've got one barrel set up. I'm gonna go set the other barrel up 
and I predict by the end of the week these both will be full. I think they're 50, 52 or 58 gallon barrels each and I've got two of them. So I think this video is probably long enough. If you've watched it to this point, thank you very much. I hope you guys learned something and I'll catch you on the next video. Take care.